Baptist Church, and welcome to our worship, virtual worship service this morning. It is indeed a blessing to be able to worship the Lord again on today. Uh, I pray that you have had a blessed week, uh, but at this time, we are going to uh, draw in together into the reins of our minds. We are going to prepare our hearts. Uh, we're going to prepare our minds to worship the Lord on today. And to bring uh, attention to our calls this morning to worship the Lord, we're going to visit Psalm 113 for our call to worship. Psalm 113. Who is like the Lord our God? Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and on the earth? He, ri he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. This morning, we have come to praise the Lord and to worship him. Uh, we worship him in spirit and in truth. I pray that this worship service today, uh, not only the words of the servants of God who will steward the worship, but the words from the man of God uh, will stir in us, not only today, but in the days of head, stir us to good works and stir us to right living and obedience to the Lord who is worthy to be praised. At this time, let us welcome our brother Travis Jenkins as he comes to lead us before the throne of grace. Good morning. If all hearts and minds are clear. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning uh, first to say thank you. Um, we just thank you uh, for all of the great things that you are doing, all of the things that you're doing uh, in this nation, God, in this city. Um, even though sometimes we may can't see it, God, we know that you're still working. So first, we just want to say thank you. Um, God, we want to uh, pray for the families that's been attacked um, by this pandemic, uh, by other illnesses, God, um, to call by name um, Sandra McDuff. God, we just pray for her and her family. Um, we just pray that you work in this situation, God. Also, God, we pray for uh, Felicia Ballard. Um, God, we just pray that you touch and heal right now, God. We know that you can, God. Um, God, we just thank you um, for revealing to us all the things you wanted us to see during this pandemic, God. Um, and we know, God, even if it's not taken away on tomorrow, we know that you have the power to do it. Um, so we just thank you for that alone. Um, we just pray that we... Um, continue to work in your will during this time, God. Continue to bless us, God, to just be the people that you want us to be. And we just pray for this service. We pray, pray for the um, minister bringing the word today, God. We just pray that all the listeners have open hearts, open ears to receive a word from you. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's giving time. So before I tell you guys the four ways that you can give, I just want to say that I miss you guys. I miss everybody being in the sanctuary. And specifically on this morning, I really miss Perry and Remy Lewis. I know they're probably shocked, but I miss you guys so much. I was just thinking of your smiling faces on the way here. So if you're ready to give, we have four different options. We know people love options. The first way is through Cash App. If you want to give through Cash App, then it is Money Sign, Plum Grove, PC. Yes, that's right. All right, the second way that you can give is you can text the number 77977. Again, that is 77977. You can also give through the Plum Grove app. That's my favorite. Um, so whether you want to give your tithes, if you want to give to a different ministry, you have a lot of different options there. So that's a really good resource. And the fourth way that you can give is that you can drop it off here at the church. The address is 2822 Foster's Ferry Road. That's Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 35401. Or you're welcome to mail it in as well. Thank you guys so much. I hope you have a great Sunday.
Good morning, Plum Grove. Today's public reading of scripture comes from Psalm 131. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Travis and Taylor Jenkins and Miss Karina, uh, for the public reading of Scripture. Plum Grove, uh, we have a special reading this morning. Um, it is time in which we have the opportunity to either learn something that we didn't know, uh, hear from uh, the leading uh, scholars and educators uh, of our time, uh, or just to reflect, to remember, and to appreciate uh, those who have come before us in the forms of their life work and what they have meant to the body of Christ. And so this morning for our special reading, we will acknowledge uh, Representative John Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian. Uh, these two stalwarts, uh, these two magnificent uh, men who have impacted our nation and our society so greatly uh, were passed, had passed away recently uh, and have transitioned uh, to their heavenly home. Uh, and although they leave this earth in their physical presence, their work will continue to speak for them for generations to come. Uh, Rep Representative John Lewis, from his early days as a student activist, uh, was an original freedom writer and a founder and leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. John Lewis became a symbol for perseverance and strength, even as he endured physical violence and imprisonment. The sit-ins that he organized at segregated lunch counters and peaceful protests that he led, marching across the South, including Bloody, Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama, became a beacon of hope in the pursuit of equal rights. As one of the Civil Rights Movement's original six, this son of an Alabama sharecropper at age 23 was the youngest speaker at the March on Washington on August 28, 1963. During that speech, he employed government leaders to wake up to the evils of segregation, closing with the words that still resonate today. We must say, Wake up, America, wake up, for we cannot stop, and we will not and cannot be patient. John Lewis began his political career as a member of the Atlanta City Council and was reelected 16 times to the U.S. House of Representatives from Georgia's 5th Congressional District, where he became known as the conscience of the U.S. Congress. The city hopes his courage, sacrifice and leadership continue to inspire the best in us and all that America has to offer. The Reverend C.T. Vivian, Cordy Tyndale Vivian, was awarded the highest medal of honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, by President Obama on November the 20th, 2014, for his extensive work alongside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., where he helped lead sit-ins and other demonstrations around the country. You see, Reverend, C Reverend Vivian's contributions to the written word will be remembered through his amassed collection of upwards of 6,000 volumes of African-American authored and African-American heritage books that uphold the African-American voice in society. Reverend Vivian also founded the nonprofit corporation CT and Octavia Vivian Museum and Archives Incorporated to provide a fund for the management of the C.T. Vivian collection now and into the future. You see, this curated collection features his collection of books, numerous pieces of art, collectibles, and many awards given to C.T. Vivian over his lifetime. The collection, along with some of his original papers, a myriad of awards and artwork, have been donated to the National Monuments Foundation. His, li his library will be, created, re will be recreated within the base of the Peace Column Museum to be located in the Rodney Cook Senior Park in Vine City, 
where his legacy will be preserved forever. I'd like to read a couple of quotes from these great men before we hear from another great man this morning. We have the opportunity to be blessed in the preaching of God's word by our very own brother Clayton Cullerton. Uh, and before we hear from him, let us hear from these two great giants of men. Hear a quote by John Lewis. He says, the civil rights movement was based on faith. Many of us who were participants in this movement saw our involvement as an extension of our faith. We saw ourselves doing the work of the almighty. Segregation and racial discrimination were not in keeping with our faith. So we had to do something. A quote from C.T. Vivian. He says, people do not choose rebellion. It is forced upon them. Revolution is always an act of self-defense. We here at Plum Grove Baptist Church, we honor the great work of these two men, uh, what they have meant to our society and to our nation. Uh, we will mourn the loss of their presence, but we will continue to be inspired by their actions and by their deeds and upholding the inherent worth of the least of these in this country. At this time, we are going to be blessed by the word of the Lord, as I said before, uh, by Brother Clayton Cullerton. Uh, we are continuing in our series on the Psalms of Ascents. Uh, I pray that this series has been a blessing to you as it has to me and to my family. Uh, and to continue on in that vein this morning, let us welcome our brother Clayton Cullerton. giving glory to God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, giving honor to Jesus, our Lord, who is our Savior and our King, and giving space to the Holy Spirit, who is the one who can fill us with hope. Good morning, Plum Grove. To Reverend Dr. Gardner for your leadership and your trust, thank you. Reverend Savage for your encouragement and your friendship, bless you the deacons and servants of our church family, to my wife and my girls at home. It is a joy and honor to stand in this pulpit today with the task of proclaiming God's word. Amen. And while I long for the day when we can safely be together in person, my girls do too, I know that it is the spirit of the living God that knits us together. And it is because we know that our God is stronger and more mighty and more contagious than any virus. It is, we, it is the ability to put our trust in him this morning. We can trust that we can gather, even virtually, knowing that where two or three are gathered, there the Lord is also. So even now, in the presence of the Lord, wherever you are, let us pray. Faithful God, we gathered this morning across various locations, longing to be revived by you. We long to know you more, to know your love and your grace and your kindness and your power more and more. I pray, Holy Spirit, that right now for those who are watching this live or who will watch this in the days and weeks to come, that you would meet them wherever they are, that you would capture their attention, that you would captivate their hearts, that you would breathe new life into us and help us to put our hope in you. I pray, my God, that in my weakness, your strength would be perfected. I offer these meditations to you, O Lord, on behalf of our church family and ask that you would purify them. Guard us from anything that is not from you and open us to anything that is. May your word fall on good soil today and may it yield a harvest that is 30, 60, and 100 fold. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 I would like to speak from the title this morning, The Satisfaction of Hope. All right. The Satisfaction of Hope. Amen. Thank you. Reverend Savage, this morning when I talk about hope, I don't mean the kind of wishing that we do when we really want something to happen. Like when we say, I hope everything will be all right. 
or I hope that we get what we need, or I hope you feel better. No, I want to talk about hope this morning like I'm talking about something that I know will happen, about certainty, about expectancy. Plum Grove, I believe that this morning the Lord wants to place a choice before us. Do we want substitutes for hope or do we want the satisfaction of hope? The substitutes for hope or the satisfaction of hope? This morning, we've got to talk about the inspiration of hope, the substitutes for hope, and the satisfactions of hope. So first, the inspiration of hope. As you know, and as was already said this weekend, we simultaneously celebrate and mourn the deaths of three of our faith giants and heroes. Right now, in the presence of Jesus, the words of God are ringing out over author and theologian J.I. Packer, the reverend and activist C.T. Vivian, and the conscience of the Congress, Representative John Lewis. They have heard the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. And as tributes and memorials to these men cover our news feeds and occupy our minds, our hearts are filled with inspiration gratitude, and amazement. My family, many of my friends were deeply shaped by the work of J.I. Packer. And this country was transformed by the faithful witness and actions of C.T. Vivian and Congressman John Lewis. In fact, you and I may not be members of the same church if it were not for their boldness and their bravery. That reality exists this morning as I stand in this place. These men stood up for their convictions at great personal cost. The unrelenting work of their hands was prolific and has impacted the lives of millions. And today they are with the Lord and I believe that they are satisfied. Like a weaned child with its mother, they are satisfied. And I don't know about you, But whenever one of our heroes dies, whether they're national leaders or only known to us personally, I find myself wanting to live that kind of life. Whether seen or unseen, famous or forgotten, I want to live my life in a way that counts for something that matters. Don't you? Don't these lives inspire you? Don't you want to live a life that is a long obedience in the same direction? Don't you want to live a life that's true to its convictions, lavish in its loves, and satisfied not by accolades or accomplishments, but by hearing the Lord say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Plum Grove, I cannot escape this question on this morning. How does someone live such a life? You know who they are. The list is long and it's filled with those people who were anchors. They were pillars, just solid people. They were not perfect. They did not always do the right thing. But somehow, in season and out of season, they were the ones whose eyes were not diverted. They were the ones who we look to in times of crisis. They did not waver and they did not quit. They stumbled, but they stood back up. Maybe you know some of these saints. Maybe they were a family member or a friend or a colleague or a mentor. Maybe they're still here. Maybe you're one of them. But still the question remains, how do we live this kind of life? When I heard that these men have passed away, I was sitting at my desk at home, working on a research paper on the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, another person who stood up for the vulnerable in the face of unrelenting evil. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian who called out the Nazis for their treatment of the Jews. As early as 1933, he stood up against all odds. He was a part of a resistance movement in Germany before and during World War II. And for this, he was arrested and sent to a prison camp where he spent most of the war. And on April 9th, 1945, he was hanged only two weeks before the camp was liberated. He wrote in his journals that he could hear the American bombs getting closer. 
This man took his stand just a short time after he spent a year in America studying in New York. And it was during that year in America that Bonhoeffer, a very white, very German man, began to attend Abyssinian Baptist Church, a missionary Baptist church in Harlem, New York. Along with his friend Albert Fisher, the son of a black preacher from Birmingham, Alabama, he had what he called, quote, one of the most important and gratifying experiences of his time in America. Every Sunday for six months, he went to this church. He said that it was in the black church that, quote, you could really still hear someone talk about, in a Christian sense, about sin and grace and love of God and ultimate hope. I believe that this man witnessed the black church and saw embodied hope. I can testify to that. On his final day, when Bonhoeffer walked out of his cell for the last time, it was reported by a fellow prisoner who had no idea who he was, that he went steadfastly, that he died with admirable calmness and dignity. The question this morning is, how do you do that? How did this man stand alongside the victims of state-sanctioned evil, even to the point of death? I want to say this morning that it was because his hope was in the Lord. It was a certainty of resurrection that allowed Bonhoeffer to face death for the sake of those who were dying. It was an unwavering expectation in the peace of new creation that made it possible for C.T. Vivian to face beatings from mobs in countless cities across this country. And it was a hope in the justice that comes from the kingdom of God that empowered John Lewis to stand on one side of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, knowing full well what awaited him on the other side. And yet he walked, one step after the other, steadfastly, with admirable calmness and dignity. The only way that someone lives such a life is to be inspired with hope. And I mean that literally, like breathed in, inspired, to be breathed into. Hope inspired into us by the Holy Spirit. And it is a call to us this morning that we receive from God's word to put our hope in the Lord. The psalmist writes, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. The psalmist lays out the choice in these two verses. He creates these contrasting images. In verse 1, it's the picture of someone who's puffed up, self-confident and proud, whose hope is in their own power, their own understanding, their own strength. And in verse 2, it's this little child who's just finished nursing, asleep in its mother's arms. And now, at first glance, when you see the word weaned, you might think, like a weaned child that doesn't need its mother's milk anymore. But the Hebrew word sense for the word weaned is actually more about being complete or finished or satisfied. Like a baby who drank its fill. With these two images in our minds, he calls us to hope in the Lord. He's saying that the experience of real hope is not one of self-confidence. Rather, it's like that of a nursing child who has all that they need, content in their mother's arms. And if you're a parent or if you've ever been around young children, you know this exact moment. I was thinking back to when our girls were nursing. I could see Emma and Alice cuddled up in Valerie's arms. The whole world could be falling apart around them, but they were just fine. (laughs) We used to call it milk drunk. Just limp, just everything's good, everything's good. And it's significant that David doesn't use the image of a father here. I think he's intentionally getting at something about God's character that we might miss if our categories are too narrow. 
David is showing us that there is something about the way that women bear God's image that we need to be able to attribute to God if we want to understand the Lord fully. I can almost imagine David with one of his kids in the palace. Maybe he's holding his son and he's inconsolable. Dad, do you know these moments? (laughs) You know them. You know them. All the bouncing and padding and walking in the world cannot soothe this child. Mothers, you know it too. You know what's coming. Maybe David could keep this child safe from a beast. He was good with the slingshot, we hear. But he was next to hopeless when it came to soothing this anxious child. So he hands him to his mother. And then the child calms, becoming quiet and nurses and settles in to its mother's arms. And I wonder if it was in that moment that David realized, wow, that's what I feel like when my hope is in the Lord. Satisfied. Plum Grove, in the chaos of our world, we need to be able to imagine God holding us like a nursing mother. We need that kind of soothing power and security in the Lord. Amidst the noise and confusion, we need satisfaction of hope. But we have to choose. You see, we cannot receive the satisfaction of hope if we have bought into the substitutions for hope. How do we replace our substitutions for hope with the real thing? Verse 1 of this psalm is a compelling definition of pride. In the first line, it talks about our hearts being lifted up, our eyes not being raised too high. In some translations, it says, my eyes are not haughty or proud. Then in line two, David references a verse from the book of Job where Job confesses before the Lord that he has uttered what he did not understand, things too marvelous for him. The point here is not that David has decided not to worry about things, that he somehow decided not to care. The point is, is that he's not looking to himself to be able to make sense of all the pride or of all the pain. He's laying down his pride. It's pride that leads us into a dependency on the substitutes for hope. These stand-in versions of the real hope that we long for. Somehow we come to believe that we have what it takes in ourselves to take care of what's wrong in the world. And so we trust not in the Lord, but in our own understanding. We consider ourselves in all our ways and we wonder why we end up with crooked paths. And then we get so used to our everyday routine of substituting our hope with self-sufficiency that we forget what it's like to have the satisfaction of the real thing. I was thinking back to when my daughter Emma was first born. And I've I've told that story before, but what happened next was so interesting and and just really hard. She spent her first week in the NICU. She'd gotten an x-ray on her stomach. She had been spitting up. She got an x-ray on her stomach, and there was a shadow. Not what you want to see in the first 24 hours of a baby's life. They were worried that something might have been blocking her bowels. It was potentially an emergency. And so they said that they wanted to pump her stomach to be sure that there wasn't a blockage. And so when we were wheeling her over to the NICU, they told me what they, what, what they were going to do, that they needed to place a tube down her throat, um, through her throat to her stomach, to, and keep it there for 24 hours. They needed to like empty out her stomach, which meant, in my mind, Not being a nurse, not being a doctor is like, if you're trying to get everything out, what's going to go in? (laughs) How do we get things in? It's tricky because if you're an infant, you basically have one job. Learn how to eat. That's the job. That's what you have to do. And up to this point, she was doing okay. And so I asked the nurse, how is she going to eat? And she said, she's not. Not for 24 hours. My baby is a whole one day old. And I said, so how's she going to (laughs) eat? And she explained that what we would do is give her an IV that would substitute nursing for her while everything was okay. 
That all sounded good at first. 24 hours passed, the new x-rays showed that everything was clear, so we've been good to go, right? Everything was going to be fine. The only problem was is that now we had no idea how dependent Emma would become on the substitute. Remember, a baby's job is to figure out how to learn how to eat. And the primary function or the primary driving force of learning how to eat is hunger. And when you're satiated with some substitute, you don't know that you need the real thing. 24 hours into your life, you learn that you don't have to figure out all the mechanics of eating. But you can get back with whatever, uh, you, can, you can get filled up with whatever sugar water they're pumping into you, right? And so you end up laying there, uninterested in nursing from your mother, who was designed to take care of you. Slowly losing weight, just getting by, failing to thrive. She was neither hungry nor satisfied. I'll say that again. She was neither hungry nor satisfied. And this is what Emma did for five or six days. In that time, Valerie and I, along with a team of nurses, had to figure out how to decrease her dependence on the substitute so that she could actually feel hungry for the real stuff. You see where I'm going? We had to decrease her dependence on the substitute so that we could really be satisfied with the real thing. This morning, brothers and sisters, we must decrease our dependence on the substitutes for hope so that we can be truly satisfied by real hope. I want to suggest that in our pride and arrogance, we give in to seven substitutes for hope. I came across this idea in an old book called The Jesus Hope. Full on with the really corny 80s, 70s graphics on the front of the book, but I thought it was brilliant. And I want to offer them to you this morning, Plum Grove. For Emma, her substitute was basically an IV pumping sugar water into her system, leaving her neither hungry nor satisfied. But what is it for you? I want to invite you to consider what is most tempting in this list of seven substitutes for hope. Number one, despair. Number two, blind optimism. Number three, escapism. Number four, self-indulgence. Number five, superstition. Number six, the goal of a totalitarian state. And number seven, radical idealism. So listen along as I describe each substitute and ask the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal which one you are most prone towards. Number one is despair. Despair replaces hope with a resignation to the belief that God has a plan for the world. Despair hands us a view of the world that diminishes the power of God and enlarges the wickedness of humanity, so much so that you're left to assume that there really is nothing to hope for. Despair is a kind of defense mechanism for hopelessness. Because if you never hope for anything, then you can never be disappointed. Therefore, despair becomes the only firm foundation on which we can build our lives. But it is a foundation made of rubble. Number two is empty optimism. This kind of optimism is more interested in wishful thinking than it is about reality. It tempts us to think that things are going to just get better somehow. Some way, this too shall pass. And it will all come out in the wash. Empty optimism is the kind of hubris that, the, that, makes the, uh, that, thinks, that brought the world into the 20, uh, 20th century. It's the kind of hubris that Lyndon Johnson brought into the 60s or that commentators had after the election of Barack Obama. Somehow, think of the folly of this statement. Woodrow Wilson had the audacity to suggest that World War I was the war to end all wars. Lyndon Johnson asserted in 1964 that, quote, we have the power to shape the civilization that we want. Let's see how that worked out. And commentators infamously said after the uh, 2008 election that we had entered into a post-racial society. 
empty optimism is appealing because it teases our longings for a better world, but it fails because it does not take seriously the problem of evil in our world. Third is escapism. With the escapism tactic as our substitute, we turn away from the realities of the world and insulate ourselves physically and emotionally from all forms of pain. In setting aside the hope of new creation, where there is no pain and no sorrow, no death, we use escapism to act as if we're already there. Some people do this by literally escaping the confines of our social reality by heading off into the wilderness or walling themselves off in a cocoon, whether it be made by streets or walls or houses. And others use escapism by turning towards the past. We feed the sense of longing that we have for the way things used to be. Not because it was actually any better, but because in doing so, some of us can simply avoid the pain that existed. In this appeal to the good old days, back when things were great, leaves us hearing the siren's call to make things great again. However, any movement away from the reality of the moment fails to fully satisfy us. We're left wanting. Fourth is self-indulgence. The substitute here is the most time-honored method of let us drink, eat, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Many of the world's greatest civilizations have collapsed amid the frenzy of entertainment that kept people's minds off of the imminent catastrophe. We soothe ourselves with shadow versions of the life that we want to live, and when that doesn't work, we help it along with whatever kind of self-medication we can find. I'll never forget a a conversation I had years ago. I was at a funeral, of all things. And I was at the wake, and I was talking to the pastor who had just performed this funeral. And he was telling me about this 78-inch TV that he bought, which 12 years ago was, like, enormous and a huge expense. He leaned back and crossed his arms. He said, Clayton, when I look at the world... I just, I just think things are coming to an end. And so we figure we might as well enjoy ourselves. The arrogant substitution of self-indulgence diverts our energy and resources away from the things that actually matter in this life and moves them towards things that are subject to decay. If you haven't been cut up already, <laughs> which I have was I was, as I was writing this um, and reading these words in, in the Jesus hope, um, fifth is superstition. And you might think that you can get past this one, but be careful. Without the satisfaction that comes from real hope, some of us are tempted to turn towards superstition. Superstition replaces real hope with the haughty assumption that somehow we can make better sense of the world than God can. Think of the arrogance. And so we end up concocting endless formulas that might help us navigate the chaos that we can't seem to do anything about. And this isn't as simple as astrology and crystal balls. It's much more subtle. Sometimes we can create this game that we play with God to try to control the Lord. Thinking that if we do this just right, Or if we pray a certain number of times, or if we never do that thing, somehow I will end up satisfied. Yet as with all the other substitute, it leaves us busy, but getting nothing done. Sixth is the goal of a totalitarian state. And in our struggle to hope in the kingdom of God, we can fall victim to this. And I believe that we are, this is a choice that the church has to make right now. We can fall victim to imagining a kind of utopia built by human hands. With fascism on one end and Marxism on the other, we end up with nothing but two paths to the same goal. Some kind of world peace brought about by human authority rather than God's authority and power. Fascism constructs the myth of a nation and requires that all 
people who hope to benefit from it have to bow down and worship it. Otherwise, you're out. And Marxism imagines a classless, egalitarian world that dehumanizes the individual, trapping them in a system that may or may not be working for them. Both paths to paradise have been destroyed by their leaders because they fail to recognize the realities of human nature, both in themselves and in the people that they lead. And lastly, for all who are in my generation, is the substitute of radical idealism. This substitute hits us hard, folks who are my age. In our holy desire to stand up for what is right and true and good, we raise our voices, we hit the streets, and we call for a revolution. We say, tear it down, let it burn. But we're very unsure about what it looks like to put something in its place. Individually, we might have opinions, but our radical idealism keeps us from asserting them and leading out of them because we don't want to offend anybody. Or we fail to lead because we're so afraid that we might commit the same mistakes that our leaders have gone, made who have gone before us that will somehow fall short. Well, guess what? We will. We don't want to allow ourselves the opportunity to make mistakes, so we keep ourselves from the opportunity to make a difference. We, allow ourselves the, we, we do not allow ourselves the opportunity to make mistakes, so we keep ourselves from the opportunity to make a difference. So which is it for you, Plum Grove? Substitutes for hope or satisfaction of hope? My heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh, people of God, O oh, Plum Grove, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Amen? Amen. We must decrease our dependence on the substitutes for hope so that we can be fully satisfied by real hope. Congressman John Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian did not live off of substitutes of hope. They had the real thing. They had the real thing. During an interview in 2004, John Lewis said this, quote, In my estimation, the civil rights movement was a religious phenomenon. When we go out to a sit-in or go out to a march, I felt and I really believe that there was a force in front of us and a force behind us. Because sometimes you didn't know what to do. You didn't know what to say. You didn't know how you were going to make it through. Make it through the day or even the night. But somehow, in some way, you believed. You had faith that it was all going to be all right. He was satisfied by hope. Like a weaned child with his mother, he marched on just a little while longer. Like a weaned child, he stayed in the seat just a little while longer. Like a weaned child, he was satisfied by hope. And so when he walked across that bridge in Selma and when he crested the top of it and he saw the whips and the nightsticks and the horses and the tear gas, he kept on going. His eyes were fixed, not on the men who stood against him, but on that which was down the road behind them. He kept his eyes fixed with certainty and expectancy and a hope on the promise of a new tomorrow. Even if he would not see it. He was simultaneously satisfied by hope, but determined to continue fighting for it. Because it is the hope of what will be that gives us the strength to fight for what could be. It is the hope of what will be that empowers us to stand up for what should be. And as the scriptures say about Jesus, it was because of the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. Can you see it, Plum Grove? Can you be satisfied?
by the promise of what will be, even while it is not. The promise of resurrection, the promise of a world from which evil has been removed once and for all, the promise of a real life lived in a new creation where there is no crying, no trouble, no pain, where death is but a faint memory and where sin is no more. So when you face the pain of this world, will you turn to the substitutes for hope? Or will you find yourself resting and living in the satisfaction of hope like a weaned child? When you're caring for a loved one and they say something sideways to you, will you choose the the, the, the substitutions for hope or the satisfaction of hope? When you're raising your child and you're terrified of the world that they're entering and what it can do to them, will you turn to the substitutions for hope or will you rest in the satisfaction of hope? When you see the world falling apart around us, when you turn on the news or thumb through your Facebook feed, will you turn to the substitutes for hope and run away? And give up? Or will you rest in the satisfaction of hope? How do you live such a life? How do you keep on going? How do you hold on? We need to rest like a weaned child in our mother's arms. We must put our hope in the Lord and in nothing else. It's a binary decision. Yes, that's right. That's right. There is no Jesus and. Mm. It is the Lord only. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you would satisfy us with your hope. Far beyond wishful thinking, Lord, we place our hope in you all of the certainty and all of the expectation that we can muster, Lord, we believe and we have faith that it is going to be all right. That because of your power and your love and your justice and your might and your peace, that we have hope. That it is a promise that we have inherited. A check that we can take to the bank. It's there waiting us, waiting for us. And so, Lord, help us to live by the power of your spirit, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, God. Help us to live in anticipation of our hope. Help us to have a hope in what will be so that we can have the strength to fight for what could be. Help us to have eyes to see the kingdom breaking into our world that moves us on just a little while longer. Just one more step, one more taste. Lord, we don't have to eat the whole meal. Just give us a taste, Lord, of your kingdom. We don't have to eat our fill right now. We know it's there. We are satisfied. We don't have to gorge ourselves, Lord. We know that you are steadfast and faithful. So help us, Father. Help us with with our hope. Fill us with hope. By your spirit, we pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen. Plum Grove, what a word we received this morning. I pray that you will revisit this in the days of head to let it uh, inspire you, uh, to let it resonate in your heart and in your mind. This is the type of word that I believe speaks to anyone who may be watching this morning. It speaks to both as us, of us who are believers, and it speaks to those who have not come into the fellowship of faith In Jesus Christ. And here's what I believe it says. 
to those of us who do believe, what David speaks to us this morning and what Brother Clayton has beautifully illustrated is that hopelessness, when we look out into the world, when we look at our current situations and circumstances, we are not above circumstances that can create hopelessness. We do not walk this life and live this life of faith with rose tinted glasses on. Jesus has not promised us a bed of roses, but what he has promised us is a hope and a future in him. And what I believe this message this morning speaks to those who don't believe and who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is that now you have an alternative to your substitutes. You've been living life in a way, you've been going about life in a fashion that uh, you have placed your stock, you've placed your hope in the substitutes that continually disappoint you and leave you empty. But what has been presented here today through the preaching of God's word is something that is substantial, something that's real, and something that will never disappoint you or leave you anything less than full. Jesus Christ is that hope this morning. He is the real thing. He is the substance for your substitutes. And so this morning, if you're watching, if you've heard this word, and you say, you know what, I'm tired of living in, in, in the margins of hope. I'm tired of living with the substitutes that leave me empty and hollow. Then this morning, we invite you to take the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by the hand. Make that binary decision to allow him to be your Lord and your Savior from this moment forward. And we can guarantee you two things. We here at Plum Grove Baptist Church will be here to support you in your uh, call to live a new life in the hope of new creation. And the second thing that we can promise you is, is that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will never leave you nor forsake you. There is forgiveness for your sins through his blood, by his sacrifice, for anything that happened up until this point. So if that's you this morning, Write in the comments. Let us know that you would like to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Inbox us. Uh, myself, Brother Clayton, Pastor Gardner, we will reach out to you, let you know what that looks like, take you through the next steps of salvation and sanctification and a life of hope and substance. Brother Clayton, thank you so much for this word this morning. At this time, we're not going to prolong the time. I'm going to invite our minister of music up, Brother Quinn Kelly, and he's going to give you the blessing and the benediction of the Lord. Plum Grove, have a blessed week. We love you, and we are so thankful to once again be able to worship with you on today. Amen. Good morning, Plum Grove. Uh, I just want to say to Brother Clayton, uh, that was a magnificent word. He said that using the illustration of giants and babies, he challenged us to decrease dependence on the substitutes of hope, that there is no Jesus and only the Lord. I pray that you find satisfaction of true hope in Jesus this morning. Please receive the benediction. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.